going through a 2022 recap, it was a fantastic year for Tesla. It was our best year ever on every level. The team did an amazing job. It's an honor, of course, to work with such such an incredibly talented group of people. So in 2022, we delivered over 1.3 million cars and achieved a 17% operating margin, the highest among any volume car maker. I think maybe among any car maker. We, so we generated $12.5 billion in net income and $7.5 billion in free cash flow. Importantly, the Tesla team achieved these records while 20, despite the fact that 2022 was an incredibly challenging year due to forced shutdowns, very high interest rates, and many delivery challenges. So it's just worth noting that all these records were in the face of massive difficulties. A credit to the, a credit to the team for achieving that. The most common question we've been getting for investors is about demand. Thus far, so I want to put that the concern to rest. Thus far in January, we've seen the strongest orders year to date than ever in our history. Currently, I'm seeing orders at well, almost twice the rate of production. So that, it's hard to say whether that will continue at twice the rate of production, but the orders are high, and, and we've actually raised the model at Y price a little bit in response to that. We know we think demand will be good despite probably a contraction in the automotive market as a whole. Basically, price really matters. I think there's just a vast number of people that want to buy a Tesla car, but can't afford it. And so these price changes really make a difference for the average consumer. But sometimes for those for people who are well, have a lot of money, they forget about how important affordability is. And there's always been our goal at Tesla to make cars that are affordable to as many people as possible. So I'm glad that we're able to do that. And yeah, so I think it's a good thing, all things considered. We're also making very good progress on cost control. And we're seeing the costs of production in Berlin and Austin drop commensurate with the growth in production, so as you'd expect. Yeah. With respect to autopilot, as of now, we deployed full self-driving beta to in, on four city streets to roughly 400,000 customers in North America. This is a huge milestone for autonomy as FSC beta is the only way any consumer can actually test the latest AI-powered autonomy. And we're currently at about 100 million miles of FSD outside of highways. And our published data shows that improvement in, state, in safety in safety statistics. <clears throat> next week i think today i mean i think it's such a monumental milestone today which people don't even realize it is it is and we we've come out and talked about a five and a half trillion dollar pivot where you have an entire ecosystem five and a half trillion is bigger than most economies bigger than most countries and that entire business model is shifting to 3d models how can i be so sure because we make the 3d models for all these e-com players, we are supplying Amazon. What does that mean? If Amazon's buying 3D models from us, and I'm communicating to you as investors, hey, this is what's happening. Very few, I mean, there's no other way for you to get this information. This is the only channel. And I'm sharing it with our investors that Amazon is all in on that's, and that's and that's the first one. That's the first that's big one, leader, one big yeah. player, right? It's one and, big player, and, and they're just in the early innings. They're uh, like in the you, you've only gotten so far like this much. Yeah, of the yeah. it's just a drop in the bucket so far. And then when you look at uh, Target, they're all in on 3D models. When you look at Walmart, they are all in on 3D models. They have no choice. Let's be crystal yeah. clear. You know, Amazon, Amazon. When Amazon goes all in, and they haven't actually even announced it yet. Uh, publicly, but they will, uh, I think this quarter or, or early Q1. When they do, everybody is going to, you know, it, it'll be like that meta moment. The whole world will shift 3D. It's already happening with the big boys, but I'm talking about the middle and, and smaller guys. It's all going to be uh, quite dramatic when the shift, uh, I mean, the shift is. Safety statistics is very clear. We would not have released the FSD beta if these safety statistics were not excellent. With our running batteries, production rate of 46 to 80 cells reached 1,000 cars a week at the end of last year, and we're increasing capacity for 46 to 80 cells by another 100 gigawatt hours. 
as announced at Giga Nevada yesterday. Our long-term goal is to get to in excess of 1,000 gigawatt hours of cells produced internally and continue to use other cell for cell providers. So to be clear, we will con- continue to use other cell providers, just that the demand for lithium-ion batteries is quasi-infinite for, 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 and will be for quite some time. So we feel we can scale a lot faster using both suppliers and internally produced cells. And we've got a, 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 an amazing plan for making the 4680 cell low cost and high energy density. Energy storage also see saw record growth, and we, that is continuing to accelerate. So it's worth remembering that the three pillars of a sustainable energy future are obviously electric vehicles, solar and wind, and then the third key item is stationary storage to store the energy from solar and wind because obviously the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So if you have those three things, you can, you can convert all of Earth to a fully sustainable situation, many times over, actually. I would like to just make it clear that there, there is a path to a, a fully sustainable future for humanity, and we, our goal at Tesla is to accelerate progress on that path as much as humanly possible. Yeah, so we're obviously ramping up mega pack production, and we expect to, it to grow at a rate quite a bit faster than our vehicle output. So in conclusion, we are taking a view that we want to keep making and selling as many cars as we can. We believe we can keep pushing for strong volume growth while retaining the industry's best operating margins. As we mentioned many times before, we want to be the best manufacturer. Really, manufacturing technology will be our most important long-term strength, and we'll talk more about our upcoming plans at the March 1st Investor Day. And, what, and lastly, I want to once again thank all of our employees for delivering another record-breaking year. Congratulations, guys. Thanks, Elon. And I think Zach has some opening remarks as well. Yeah, thanks, Martin. So as Elon mentioned, 2022 was a terrific year for Tesla. I also want to congratulate the Tesla team and also say a thank you to our suppliers for your support during quite a volatile year. On a full-year basis, revenue increased over 50%, operating income doubled, free cash flows increased over 50%, and our margins remained industry-leading. Additionally, we continue to make progress on overhead efficiencies as non-GAAP OPEX as a percentage of revenue improved further. For Q4 specifically, sequential and annual margin was impacted by ASP reductions as we were managing through COVID impacts in China, uncertainty around the consumer tax credit in the U.S., and a rising interest rate environment. Note that in 2022, rising interest rates alone had effectively increased the price of our cars in the U.S. by nearly 10%. Additionally, COGS per unit has increased on a year-over-year basis, driven primarily by three factors. First is raw materials and inflation led by lithium prices and discussed at length in previous calls. Second, we are working through the early ramp of inefficiencies of our Austin and Berlin and in-house cell production factories. Third, our vehicle mix over the last year has moved more heavily towards Model Y, which carries a slight cost premium to Model 3. Partially offsetting these impacts, we've continued to execute on Tesla controllable cost reductions in line with the progress we've made in prior years. These improvements include our continued work to gradually move towards a regionally balanced build of vehicles. The energy business had its strongest year yet across all metrics, led by steady improvement in both retail and commercial storage. While much work remains to grow this business and improve costs, we believe we are on a good trajectory. As we look towards 2023, we're moving forward aggressively, leveraging our strength and cost. There are three key points I wanted to make here. First, on demand, as Elon mentioned, customer interest in our products remains high. Second, on cost reduction, we're holding steady on our plans to rapidly increase volume while improving overhead efficiency, which is the most effective method to retain strength in our operating margins. In particular, we're accelerating improvements in our new factories in Austin, Berlin, and in-house cells, where inefficiencies are the highest. But we are attacking every other area of cost and unwinding cost increases created from multiple years of COVID-related instability. This includes logistics, expedites, accumulation of material buffers, part premiums, productivity, and overheads, as an example. As the world transitions from an inflationary to deflationary environment, We expect a strong partnership with our suppliers on this journey as well. In net, we've priced our products with a view towards a longer-term cost structure. Thus, there will be an impact on operating margin in the near term. 
However, we believe our margins will remain healthy and industry leading over the course of the year. Third, we are continuing to ensure funding is prioritized for our long-term roadmap. This includes expanding in-house cell production, bringing Cybertruck to market, development of our next generation vehicle platform, expansion of our manufacturing footprint, and growth of the energy business. We're looking forward to discussing these plans in more detail on our investor day in a month. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zach. Let's now go to investor questions. The first question is, some analysts are claiming that Tesla orders net of cancellations came in at a rate less than half of production in the fourth quarter. This has raised demand concerns. Can you elaborate on order trends so far this year and how they do current production rates? I think we've already answered that question. Yes, um, exactly. The demand far exceeds production, and we actually are making some small price increases as a result. Thank you. The second question is in similar vein. What is the initial reaction been to global price reductions in early 1Q 2023, specifically in terms of order intake levels? We've answered that one as well. Yeah. So let's go to the next one. The next investor question is, will Tesla be able to take full advantage of advanced manufacturing production credits for battery cells packs? So $3,700 per long range Model 3 and Model Y. It's $45 a kilowatt for autos and energy products, and how much does Tesla expect to earn in the coming year from these credits? I'll, I'll say a little bit about it, then I think Zach will we'll add some. Long term, we expect these, uh, the value of these credits to be very significant. You can do the math. If we were to get anywhere near 1,000 gigawatt hours a year of production or even a few hundred gigawatt hours, it's, it's, it's very significant. But the credits do rely upon domestic manufacturing. And in the case of Panasonic, with domestic manufacturing, we're splitting the value of the credit. It'll, the value of the credits this year will not be gigantic, but I think it could be gigantic in the future. It would, we think it probably will be very significant in the future. Yeah, just to add and, and put some boundaries on what we're expecting in terms of impact to Tesla for this year. So different products we think we'll get different amounts of credit. The regulations here are still in flux and there continues to be updates, so this is just our best understanding at the moment. But we think on the order of 150 million to 250 million per quarter this year and growing over the course of the year as our volumes grow. And part of the work we're doing here, which is part of what this incentive package is trying to incentivize, is as Elon mentioned, to move more manufacturing onshore in the United States, uh, which is Tesla's plans anyways. And so I think we're pretty well positioned over the coming years to take advantage of this. But then also part of what the goal of this incentive package is to improve adoption from our customers. And so we also want to use these incentives to improve affordability as we think about what the price points are on our products going forward. And so as we were thinking about our pricing changes in the U.S. a couple of weeks ago that we announced, we were looking at what the credit benefit to Tesla would be to make sure that customers are able to receive the benefit not only from this that we're receiving to some extent, but also on the consumer-facing side, which is currently 7500 per car of tax credit, assuming that subject to the MSRP caps and the income caps. We want to use this to accelerate sustainable energy, which is our mission and also the goal of this bill. Thank you very much. The next question from investors is, after recent price cuts, analysts release expectations that Tesla automotive gross margin, excluding leasing and credits, will drop below 20%, an average selling price around 47000 across all models. Where do you see average selling price and gross margins after the price cuts? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll jump in on this. There's certainly a lot of uncertainty about how the year will unfold, but I'll share what's in our current forecast for the moment. Based upon these metrics here, we believe that we'll be above both of the metrics that are stated in the question. So 20% automotive gross margin, excluding leases and red credits, and then 47K ASP across all models. And two other comments I want to make on this, just tactically on sequential ASP changes from Q4 to Q1, it just as a reminder that ASP reduction is not as large as the reduction in configurator prices. As in Q4, we had backlog customers that were delivering cars to at a lower price book, given that backlogs had been so long for so much of 2022. But then also there are various programs in place that we used in Q4 that lowered ASPs. What, the second comment I wanted to make here is that as a management team here, we're most focused on, on what our operating margin is. 
And so as other areas of the business become more important, particularly the energy business, which is growing faster than the vehicle business, and as we're heavily focused on operating leverage here, improving efficiency of our overheads, we think that the right metric for us to be focused on is operating margin. And so I wanted to make sure that I shared that with the investor community as well, because that is what we're primarily managing to now. Yes, something that I think some of the smart retail investors understand, but, but I think a lot of others maybe don't, is that the every time we sell a car, it has the ability, just from up, uploading software, to have full self-driving enabled. And the full self-driving is obviously getting better very rapidly. That's actually a tremendous upside potential because all of those cars, with a few exceptions, only a small percentage of cars don't have hardware 3. So that means that there's millions of cars where full self-driving can be sold at, at essentially 100% gross margin. And the value of it, of FSC grows as it beca- as the autonomous capability grows, and then when it becomes fully autonomous, that is a value increase in the fleet. That might be the biggest asset value increase of anything in history. Yeah. Thank you. Let's go to the next investor question. Since Elon started political influencing, polls from Morning Consult and YouGov show Tesla brand <laughs> you can trust them with your life. Show Tesla brand fa- favorability declining in 2022 and division among parties and lines. Such brand damage can impact demand. Does Tesla track favorability, and how will any brand damage be mitigated? Let me check my Twitter account. Okay, so I've got 127 million followers. It continues to grow. Very rapidly. That suggests that I'm reasonably popular. I might not be popular by some people, but for the vast majority of people, my follow account speaks for itself. I, I'm the most interactive account, social media account, I think, maybe in the world, and certainly on Twitter. And that actually predated the Twitter acquisition. I think Twitter is actually an incredibly powerful tool for driving demand for Tesla. And I would really encourage <coughs> companies out there of all kinds, automotive or otherwise, to make more use of Twitter and to use their Twitter accounts in ways that are interesting and informative, entertaining, and it will help them drive sales just as it has with Tesla. Net value of Twitter, apart from a few people who are complaining, is gigantic, obviously. This is software, as we've, we talked about. So the profit margins are going to be 90%. So we don't care who makes a 3D model. Right now we make 3D models. There's a couple of other companies that make 3D models. But think about Amazon, back to that use case again. We're a preferred partner for Amazon. They're gonna be opening the floodgates. Right now they have not opened the floodgates for all of their um, sellers to convert their products to 3D. Once they do open the floodgates, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, which is happening Q4 of 2022. Okay. And, you know, we know because we talked to Amazon, I spoke to them yesterday. So this is happening. And what does that mean? We're going to be front and center with Toggle 3D. We're going to be introduced to Amazon manufacturers and sellers. We're going to put them on the Toggle 3D platform. We're going to say, bring your 3D models, or if you don't have any 3D models, we'll make you 3D models. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. Please provide a detailed explanation of where you are on the 4680 ramp, what are the current roadblocks, and when do you expect to scale to 10,000 vehicles a year, a week? Yeah. Thanks, Martin. First, I just want to say congrats and thanks to the Tesla 4680 team for achieving uh, 1K a week. And Q4 was no small feat, definitely a result of more than a couple of years of hard work. As far as where we stand in Texas, one of four lines are in production with the remaining three in stages of commissioning and install. Really our 2023 goal as a 4680 team is to deliver a cost-effective ramp of 4680s well ahead of Cybertruck. Focus areas are dialing in and improving the quality of the high volume supplied mechanical parts and driving factory process yields up as much as possible. Between the two of those things, if we achieve those key goals, we'll be well set up to for a major 4680 year in 2024. Thank you. Uh, next investor question is, Elon said previously that FSD hardware 4 will most likely come first in Cybertruck. Is that still the current plan? Do you expect there to be an upgrade path for hardware 3 cars to hardware 4? Yes, yeah, Cybertruck will have 4 
And uh, for 2023, Cybertruck will not be a, really a significant contributor to the bottom line, but it will be in uh, next year. So it's an incredible product. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to drive it personally. It will be the car that I drive uh, every day. Actually, just I'm wearing the T-shirt with the smashed glass, and uh, it's just one of those products that only comes along once in a while, and it's really special. Yeah, I'm doing it. So... With respect to upgrading cars that have hardware 3, I don't think that will be needed. Hardware 3 will not be as good as hardware 4, but I'm confident that hardware 3 will still far exceed the average, the safety of the average human. So what we're aiming for is how do we get ultimately to, let's say for argument's sake, if hardware 3 can be, say, 2 or 300% safer than human, Hardware 4 might be 5 or 600 percent. It will be a hardware 5 beyond that. But what really matters is, is are we improving the average safety on the road? But it is the cost and difficulty of retrofitting hardware 3 with hardware 4 is quite significant. So it would not be, I think, economically feasible to do so. Thank you. The next question is for Zach. Zach, when do you think Tesla insurance will become big enough revenue source to warrant providing more details in the financials of the business so investors can compare it to other insurance companies? Yeah, I think it's probably going to take some time before this business is large enough for specific financial disclosures, but I'm happy to provide an update on where we stand in the business. So we're currently at a $300 million annual premium run rate as of the end of last year. We're growing 20% a quarter, so it's growing faster than the growth in our vehicle business. And in the states in which we're operating, on average, 17% of the customers in those states are using a Tesla insurance product. So, and that number continues to take up as we spend more time in markets. And we see most of the adoption occurring when folks take delivery of a new car as they're setting up insurance for the first time, as opposed to going back and switching when they already have insurance set up. So there's an an inherent stickiness in the insurance business. But No, I was just going to say, just as a broader reminder on kind of the motivation for starting this business, it was to improve, and still is, to improve the total cost of ownership of our cars given that we're seeing high premiums of insurance from third-party companies. And that remains our priority here. We'll obviously run this as a healthy business, but we want to make sure we keep our costs low and insurance stays affordable to our customers. Yeah, and so there there are two really important side benefits for Tesla insurance that are worth mentioning, one of which Zach alluded to, which is that just by Tesla offering insurance for our cars at a competitive rate, that makes the other car insurance companies offer better rates for Teslas. So it has a, a bigger effect than you think because it improves total cost ownership or insurance costs even when they don't use Tesla insurance because now, you know, the, the guy goes into the world have to compete with Tesla and cannot charge outrageous insurance for Teslas. So it's great. So it has a, an amplified effect. Very important. Uh, then it, it is also giving us a good feedback loop into minimizing the cost of repair of Teslas for all Teslas worldwide, because we obviously want to minimize the cost of repairing a Tesla if it's in a, in a collision and for Tesla insurance. And previously, we didn't actually have good insight into that because the other insurance companies would cover the cost. And actually, the cost in some cases were unreasonably high. So we've actually adjusted the design of the car and made uh, changes in the software of the car to um, minimize the cost of repair I obviously minimize the first the, the best repair is no repair avoid the accident entirely which since every tesla comes with the most advanced active safety in the world whether or not you buy full self-driving you still get the intelligence of full self-driving for active safety active collision prevention so it's giving us this really good feedback loop for again reducing cost total cost of ownership and also just figuring out how to get if, if somebody's car is in a in an accident, most accidents are actually small. They're like a broken fender or scratched side of the car or something like that. They're not uh, that's the vast majority of accidents. But we're actually solving how to get somebody's car repaired very quickly and efficiently and back in their hand. And like I said, those improvements actually apply then to all cars. And like we're making, just to emphasize another key point, because some of these points might be less apologetic for being repetitive, but it's remarkable how small changes in design of the bumper and, uh, and improving, of the, obviously improving the logistics of spare part, or providing spare parts needed for collision repair have an enormous effect on the repair. So if you're waiting for a part to get repaired and that part takes a month, now you've got a month of having to rent another car. It's very extremely expensive. And of course, you're missing the car that you love and want, actually want to drive. This is a, actually 
a very significant effect on total cost ownership and customer happiness. Thank you. The next question from investors, is Cybertruck production still on track for mid-year? It, we do expect production to start I don't know, maybe sometime this summer, but it's, I always like try to downplay the start of production because the start of production is always very slow. But it, it, it increases exponentially, but it's always very slow at first. So I wouldn't put too much stock in start of production. When does volume production actually happen? And that's next year. next week, I think. Today, I mean, I think it's such a monumental milestone today, which people don't even realize. It is, it is. And we, we've come out and talked about a five and a half trillion dollar pivot where you have an entire ecosystem. Five and a half trillion is bigger than most economies, bigger than most countries. And that entire business model is shifting to 3D models. How can I be so sure? Because we make the 3D models. For all these e-com players, we are supplying Amazon. What does that mean? If Amazon's buying 3D models from us, I, and I'm communicating to you as investors, hey, this is what's happening. Very few, I mean, there's no other way for you to get this information. This is the only channel. And I'm sharing it with our investors that Amazon is all in on that's, and that's and that's the first one. That's the first that's big one, leader. One big yeah. player, right? It's one and, big player, and, and they're just in the early innings. They're uh, like in the you, you've only gotten so far like this much. Yeah, of the yeah. It's just a drop in the bucket so far. And then when you look at uh, Target, they're all in on three D models. When you look at Walmart, they are all in on three D models. They have no choice. Let's be crystal yeah. clear. You know, Amazon, Amazon. When Amazon goes all in, and they haven't actually even announced it yet. Uh, publicly, but they will, uh, I think this quarter or, or early Q1. When they do, everybody is going to, you know, it, it'll be like that meta moment. The whole world will shift 3D. It's already happening with the big boys, but I'm talking about the middle and, and smaller guys. It's all going to be uh, quite dramatic when the shift, uh, I mean, the shift has happened. Thank you. Yeah, that's right, Elon. Just to emphasize on that, we started installation all the production equipment here in Giga, Texas, castings, GA, general assembly, body shops. We built all our beta vehicles, some more coming still in the next months. But as you said, the ramp will really come 20, 2024. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And the last investor question <laughs> is, uh, w with near infinite global demand for energy storage, yeah, seriously. Where should Tesla build the next megapack factories? How many are needed on each continent? It's a good question. It's not something we, I think, would, I think we'll provide an update about that in the future, but it's something we're thinking about very carefully. But really kind of what is the fastest path to 1,000 gigawatt hours a year of production? You'll see announcements come out later this year and the next that answer that question. Thank you. Okay, and now let's go to analyst questions. The first analyst question comes from Rod Latch from Wolf Research. And Rod, feel free to unmute your mic. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Just firstly, it sounds like your 1.8 million unit volume indication for this year is somewhat more supply constrained and demand constrained. Then I have a follow up on, on cost. Is that an accurate statement? <laughs> okay, our internal Production potential is actually closer to 2 million vehicles, but we're saying 1.8 because, I don't know, there just always seems to be some friggin' force majeure thing that happens somewhere on Earth. <laughs> and we, we don't control if there's like earthquakes, tsunamis, wars, or pandemics, etc. If, if it's a smooth year, actually, without some big supply chain interruption or massive problem, we actually have the potential to do 2 million cars this year. We're not committing to that, but I'm just saying that's the potential. And I think there's, there would be demand for that, too. Yeah, th thanks for clarifying that. And on, on the cost side, the numbers that we just saw from you, as you pointed out, were way down the 46, 4860 ramp, the Berlin, Austin, gigacastings, processes not at rate. Can you give us a bit of an indication of the headwind that you're absorbing from those things like you did last quarter? And then lastly, on, on cost, do you think that we can tease out an interesting data point from on where battery costs are headed from this that you just made last night? If I'm correct, 
it looks like the investment cost per kilowatt hour is less than half of what I've seen anywhere else, maybe maybe $30 a kilowatt hour for that capacity. I don't think we want to say the specific number, but it's interesting if you look at the size of the of, of Giga Nevada that is allocated to make 100 gigawatt hours is a small fraction of the size that currently makes about 35. Yeah, the goals we outlaid at Battery Day on reducing the investment required to deploy cell manufacturing, that's been a key focus of ours, and the team is doing a good job hitting hitting the marks on that focus. Yeah, and it goes back to the point I was making, and I said this several years ago, I think it tells us really the competitive strength that will be by far the hardest for other companies to replicate is Tesla being just damn good at manufacturing, having the most advanced manufacturing technology in the world. And if you've got that sort of advanced manufacturing toolbox, you can apply it to many things. And we're applying it now to battery cells. I should also say that there, we have other products in development. We're not going to announce them, obviously, but they're very exciting. And I think we'll blow people's minds when, when, they, when we reveal them. Tesla has the most exciting product roadmap of any company on Earth by a long shot, and you know, we'll continue to, I think, be in that position. But we've got more great ideas than we know what to do with here. The future is very exciting. I, as I said in the last call, I, there's going to be bumps along the way, and I think we'll probably have a pretty difficult recession this year. Probably. I hope not, but probably. And so you, one can't predict the short-term sort of stock value because when there's a recession and people panic in the stock market, then prices of stocks, or value of stocks can drop sometimes to surprisingly low levels. But long-term, I am convinced that Tesla will be the most valuable company on Earth. Thank you. And I think, Zach, there was a question on cost headwind in, in Q4. Success is there. Right. It's just so basically to develop your okay. drug. Okay, so I, I think, okay, so based on comps, I'm just going to throw some numbers out there. Okay, so let's let's say the market you're going after is, you know, a billion plus, which you're de it's definitely bigger than a billion dollars. The autism market in general, like, you know, potentially, and other, other you know, because again, investors would, you know, biotech invest, you know, healthcare farmer investors, you know, they're looking at this, okay, it's an orphan drug, but um, the off-label is really, that's the, that's the thing they're going to focus on. And so that's, let's call it a billion plus. Phase two, is it safe to say it's worth, you know, a hundred million? You know, why right. not? Yeah, I mean, at phase two, I think that's easily attainable. Yeah. So phase two, a hundred million bucks. I mean, we've, we've seen, you know, phase two, you know, biotech pharma companies with big, yeah. So, so basically that would be a 10 bagger. Once you have a positive phase two, a study, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm obviously I'm excited about the potential for my, for the company I work for. You can immediately apply for sympathetic approval. You do not have to go and do another phase two study or a phase three. You can ask the Canadian authority for sympathetic approval and do a post-marketing safety study. So the value could go up even more, but I don't want to think that way. I want to take one step at a time, and I want to prove that the pathway we're taking is the proper one. Yeah. Okay. But uh, so, so basically, the bottom line is, which is, I think, what what investors want to know is, okay, what's the path for the company to be at ten x? So we're looking at potentially, potentially. Again, this is not, you know, we're not here, but you know, there is a path to get there in the next, let's call it four months. I'll even say six months, just to give it a little, based on, you know, once you get the these these milestones that we talked about getting the pills, getting the study of health candidates. Yeah, you know, our weighted average cogs for the company, if, if you were to assume Austin and Berlin were at the cost structure of our other factories, it was on the order of 2,000 to 2,500 of headwinds. So I, I think from there you come back into margin impact of those factories as of end of Q4. Thank you very much. And let's go to the next question from Pierre Ferragu from New Street Research. Pierre, please go ahead. Thanks, Martin. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Excellent. Zach, I, actually, I'd like to follow up on the data point you just gave. Um, if I look back at the Cox per car, you guys bottomed close to $36,000 in the middle of 2021. And then 
the number went up as you had to face with inflation in input costs and the ramp of Berlin and Texas. And this quarter, I think we are close to 40K and we picked maybe close to $42,000 at some point last year. And so my question from here is, how much time do you think it takes you to get back to this kind of 36K, which would mean Berlin and then Texas and like the input cost, all that stuff is normalizing. Is that like, a, and that would be like a kind of a 10% decline in the Cox per car. Is that something we can hope to see this year or is that too optimistic? The Austin and Berlin ramp in efficiencies in 4680 will make a substantial amount of progress on that over the course of the year, and that's within Tesla's control. You were doing a lot of work on cost reduction outside of that, and we talked about supply chain costs, expedites logistics, attacking everything. On the raw materials and inflation side, where lithium is the large driver there, and this was a meaningful source of cost increase for us, we'll have to see where lithium prices go. And we're not fully exposed to lithium prices, but I think in general, is what we've seen from our forecast here. Cost per car of lithium in 2023 will be higher than 2022. That's a headwind that would have to be overcome to return back to those levels. So I don't think we'll get there this year, but I think we'll make progress. And we can continue to find ways to offset these raw material costs that we don't have control over. And is there any, anything on that? Yeah, like on the non-sales raw material, we begin to capture the benefits of indexes tapering out. But due to the length of various supply chains, it does take time before this is reflected in our financials. And while aluminum is down like 20% year over year, steel is about 30% down year over year. The global non-sales raw materials market continues to be influenced by geopolitical situations in Europe, high production costs due to labor cost increases and energy spikes, and disruptions due to natural disasters like typhoon in Korea four months ago, pandemic lockdowns. So we believe that meaningful price corrections will ultimately come, but it remains uncertain exactly. In the meantime, we continue to redesign supply chain to make it more efficient and work with our supplier partners to find more efficiencies, streamline logistics and transportation to reduce costs. Excellent. Um, Thank you. And I have a quick... Sorry, if you wanted to say something. I was just going to say, we're also... Our fleet is starting to mature, the 3Y fleet, and... We're gathering a, a lot of data out of that fleet to understand how we can bring some margin that we didn't know we had out of the product. So over the course of 2023 on the powertrain side, we're actually going to go act after sort of some materials where we're paying for more performance than we need or we have more content than we need without impacting reliability at all. And that will actually add up to a pretty significant cost reduction on the powertrain side over the course of 2023. So we're not just relying on supply. We're also doing design actions to, to bring cost up. Yeah, and yeah. my guess is if there is a recession is a serious one, and I think it probably will be, but I hope it isn't. But then it, it, that, that that would lead to meaningful decreases in almost all of our input costs. So I would expect to see deflation in our input costs most likely, which would then lead to, yeah, better margin. I'm just, I'm just guessing here. So this is... But that, 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 that would be my... Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. So as a quick follow-up, Elon, I was thinking about like FSD and when you look at like the situation today compared to a year ago, it's like the progress has been like amazing in the quality of the product, but also it's, uh, it's rolled out. And so I was wondering how much is this like impacting the tech rate of FSD today? So do you already see that people are getting more excited by FSD because they see it around them on 400,000 cars and they see the value of the service already? Or is that too early to really see, to expect like an uptick in in the trend is very strong towards use of FSD. And as you allude to, with each incremental improvement, the enthusiasm obviously increases. And I think something that still a lot of people out there don't quite appreciate is that Tesla which I've always said is as much a software company as a hardware company, but Tesla is really one of the world's leading AI companies. This is a big deal, both AI on the software side and on the hardware side. With the Hardware 3 inference computer, still the most efficient inference computer in the world, despite being, at this point, five years old from the design point, and with Hardware 4 coming and then Hardware 5 beyond that, with where there are significant leaps, and the Dojo a computer we expect to be using that operationally at Tesla later this year. And we're seeing just a lot of world-class AI talent join the company. There's also the long-term potential of Optimus, where we're able to use our expertise in electric motors and power electronics 
batteries and advanced manufacturing to be able to make a humanoid robot that is actually useful and can be made at high volume with, with exceptional capabilities because of the autopilot AI where we take the, because of the, the car is like a robot on four wheels and the Optimus is a robot on legs. But the, as we get closer and closer to solving real world AI and we don't see anyone even close to us in, in, in achieving this, but the value, I think you appreciate this and a few others do, but most uh, that, don't know what I'm talking about, but it's this is the the thing that has order of magnitude potential market cap improvement for for Tesla. Thank you. And the next question comes from Alex Potter from Piper Sandler. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So, quick one on FSD. This, I guess, for Zach. Obviously, you unlocked some deferred revenue in the quarter that'll translate presumably into higher margins on every incremental sale going forward, so long as people opt in for FSD. But was wondering if you're able to disclose the percentage of the $15,000 price uh, that you're not going to be able to recognize as revenue up front rather than deferred. Yeah, the way that we've structured this is the full self-driving package is two components. There's enhanced autopilot, the price of which is listed on the website, we fully recognize that. Then there's an incremental, which is for the additional features that full self-driving offers, and we've released a portion of that. And then there's a minority of the total package that's remaining that will be released over time as software updates are there. And uh, in our shareholder letter, in addition to disclosing the dollar amount of the deferred revenue release, we also included in there the dollar value of the balance of unreleased deferred revenue that will be released over time with future software updates. Can you go into some of the potential indications and things down the road in terms of the pipeline that you're going to have? Yeah, absolutely. Look, you're looking at receptor actions in the brain. Um, a lot of diseases are very similar in origin, neuroinflammatory, whether it's multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's disease have memory problems. Alzheimer's disease, memory problems. Lou Gehrig's disease, memory problems. So there's receptors in the brain that psilocybin may be working on. They may not be just the receptor for autism. The same receptor may be involved in another neurologic disorder like Parkinson's disease. We have to find that out. So we're gonna be doing some more basic experiments to look at other receptor actions in the brain. Those are being organized as we speak uh, with our uh, scientists in Italy. Um, with respect to the receptor, we found, and, and also the scientific evidence, that the 5-HD, 5-HT, hydroxytryptamine receptor, is very similar to this 5-HT2C receptor for diabetes. Why? Is psilocybin also increasing sensitivity of the body to insulin? We don't know that. And I'm very interested once we <clears throat> get beyond the fragile X, get our drug approved, to do some research into diabetes because the 5-HT1A receptor is very near the 5-HT2C receptor. So we have a lot to learn. Um, and, and as Plato said, you never know the answer. You only approach the answer. I think we're going to approach many answers with our psychedelic program. We, have, we don't have just one drug. As I said earlier, we have the rutinacin, baocystin, and we're going to look at these other tryptamine derivatives and other disorders. Okay, great. And then maybe one additional question here on the incremental capacity in Nevada, the 4680s that you're planning. It's a lot of batteries, obviously, and presumably you won't be putting all of those in Tesla Semi. So I guess two questions about the, that incremental capacity. First, is it correct to assume that all of those 4680s are going to be more or less fungible and usable in your entire range of products? And if the answer is yes, then if you had to guess, how do you think that 100 gigawatt hours would be allocated between your various end markets? I don't know. This is a bit too much guessing at this point. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. You're right. Not yeah. all of the 100 gigawatt hours are going to go into the semi-trucks. That is correct. We can, let's say, like, we, I alluded to a number of future products. Those future products would use the 4680. 
Thank you. And the next question comes from George from Canaccord Research. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. So you recently adjusted prices, and that may have put many of your competitors in the back foot. In addition to that, your capital markets have recently gotten a lot tougher. So with those factors in mind, I'm curious how you see the current competitive landscape changing over the next few years, and who as your chief competitors five years from now? Five years. Five years is a long time. I was with the Tesla Autopilot AI team late, until late last night, and just were just asking me, I was just like, so who do we think is close to Tesla with, for a general solution for self-driving, and we still don't even know really who would even be the, the, the distant second. Yeah, we, it, it, it really seems like we're, you, I, I, right now, I don't think you could see second place with a telescope, or at least we can't. I don't, that won't last forever, and, and, and five years, I don't know, the, probably somebody's figured it out. I don't think it's any of the car companies that we're aware of. I'm just guessing that someone might figure it out eventually, so... Yeah. Beyond that, Elon, like in the vehicle space, even though the market's shrinking, we're growing, and EVs have doubled almost year over year. So whoever keeps up with the trend of EVs is going to be a competitor. The Chinese are scary. We always say that. But I, a lot of people always look at the e-market share, but we always look at it as how much of the total vehicle space do we have, and we're just going to keep growing in that space. It's not, there's 95% for us to go get. Yeah, and I do want to say that we have a lot of respect for car companies in China. They are the most competitive in the world. That is our experience, and the Chinese market is the most competitive. They work the hardest, and they work the smartest. That's So a lot of respect for the China car companies that we're competing against. And uh, so if I were to guess, there would probably some company out of China is most likely to be second to Tesla. But we are, uh, uh, the Tesla China team is winning in China. <laughs> so we, yeah. And I think we actually are able to attract the best talent in China. And hopefully that continues. Yeah, super fired up about the future, and yeah, well, it's going to be great. Just as a follow-up, the Inflation Reduction Act has created huge tax incentives for commercial vehicles. You mentioned an incredibly interesting product pipeline. Are there maybe some plans to accelerate commercial vehicle form factors outside of the Tesla Semi to help accelerate EV adoption? Well, I was basically saying that, yes, but I'm not going to give you details because this is a nice try. Nice try. <laughs> Yeah, of course. We have to always look at what is the limiting factor for new vehicles because if the you know, for the longest time we've been constrained on total cell lithium ion production output, and so people said, like, why not bring this other car to market or that other car to market? It doesn't really help if all you're doing is shuffling around the, the batteries from one car to another. In fact, it hurts because you add complexity, but you don't add incremental volume. So it's pointless. In fact, counter, like, it's counterproductive to, to add model complexity without solving the availability of lithium ion batteries. So as we saw, as we get, uh, so we want a new product, new product introduction to match where the cells are available for that new product to use those cells without cannibalizing the cells of the other cars. That, that, that's the actual limiting factor for new, new models, not anything else really. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. The next question comes from William Stein from Truist. Great. Thanks for taking my question. Elon, you started to answer this earlier, but I'd like to ask this question about the AI elements of your business and ask if you could comment on progress around Dojo and Optimus and your anticipation for the likelihood, for example, for, for the company to disconnect the GPU cluster in favor of Dojo and to have some market achievement in Optimus. Yeah, obviously, with, since we're still at the early stages, there are big error bars in any predictions. So it's, it's like easy, I think, easy to predict the long term, but uh, hard to predict the time in between now and then. But it's what we think uh, Dojo will be competitive with the NVIDIA H1 at the end of this year, and then hopefully surpass it next year. And the key there is, I think, the, is, is what's the energy usage required for a given amount of, or if, or if you're training a frame of video, how, how what's the energy cost required to do that training? And we think probably, at least we said this already actually at AI, AI Day 2, so it's not new information, but we do see potential for an order of magnitude improvements uh, relative to GPU, what, what GPUs can do for Dojo, which is obviously very specialized for AI training. It's hyper-specialized for AI training. It's not 
wouldn't be great for other things, but it should be extremely good for AI training. So just like if you do an ASIC for something, it's going to be better than a CPU. This is in some ways like a giant ASIC. And, and we're able to, since we're operating one of the biggest GPU clusters in the world already, we've got a good sense of how efficient the GPU clusters operate and what Dojo needs to do in order to be competitive. But we think that it does have a fundamental architectural advantage because it's designed not to be a, the GPU is trying to do many things for many people. They're trying to do graphics, video games, doing crypto mining, so it's doing a lot of things. We're just doing one thing, and that is training. And we're also optimizing the low-level software to so it, it, at a very bare metal level, so it's just insanely good at efficient training. And the intercommunication between the Dojo mod- modules is extremely high. It's not, you're not going across an Ethernet cable. It's a, so anyway, the, this, we see a path to an order of magnitude improvement in the energy efficiency for you, per given unit of training. But we also have to achieve that, and so when will it be achieved? It's hard to say. But we, we do so path to, to get there. And then also in an inference, like once you've got the, something trained, if you want to have a product, as a consequence of that training, and that product may not be anything to do with cars, then the efficiency of inference is extremely important. And we, so we, we also have by far the most efficient inference computer in, uh, the, with the FSD computer in the car. But this has potential for products that like so that aren't part even really in, in automotive. Thank you. And William, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, it sounds like the 1.8 million units you expect this year is supply, not demand, limited supply, it sounds like, by the lithium batteries. If you were to become demand limited, can you talk to us about your propensity to use price and and your relatively high industry margins to, to grow units and share? To be clear, the 1.8 million is not self-supply limited. That, and that, yeah, we did address that number earlier in the call. I'm going to answer yeah, it's roughly, the cell supply is roughly matched with that. And it's, it's you know, 1.8 million cars. If we get lucky, it could be more. And then the rest would go into stationary storage, the Powerwall and Megapack. Yeah, so, true. Okay, let's have the final question from Adam Jonas. Hi, Elon. First question, is it time for Tesla to significantly Family expand the captive Finco. We only have four and a half billion of these receivables. It's basically nothing compared to other big auto companies. Then I have a follow up. Oh, Zach, maybe just press the Tesla. Yeah. Yeah, and the way that we've been using captive financing so far is to plug what we believe to be gaps in the market of existing third party products. And so we have a couple of offerings in Europe. We do loans for our energy business, retail energy business here in the U.S. We do leasing, and we do a small amount of U.S. loans that are very targeted. And so we're using captives to support market gaps, as I mentioned. So basically as a vehicle to support vehicle sales, make sure customers have access. I do think there's opportunity here to continue to grow this. We are growing it slowly here. It is a consumer of cash, so we're being cautious on how we do that. But the plumbing is in place. To, to do a lot more here. Uh, and, and I think we'll have to see how things unfold over the course of the year and make decisions real time as to how much we ramp it up versus ramp it back. I think if we see, if we see a severe recession this year, which, like I said, hopefully we don't, in, in, in severe recessions, cash is king big time because it's mm-hmm. in such short, short supply. So we want to be cautious about using cash for loans and that sort of thing for cars. I feel we're in a very strong position to get through a recession because we really don't have any debt, and we've got over $20 billion of cash, which is great. The cash is earning a ridiculous return, a good return. So it's like non-trivial in the interest rate. Is, it actually means the $20 billion is earning like quite a good amount. And I've made this point on Twitter a few times, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call understand the, the, that the basic value of a security is a function of the risk free rate, or we'll see how risk free it really is, but the, of the T-bill rate. So if you've got, I think the, if I recall correctly, the S&P 500 has a long-term rate of return of, of roughly 6%. And so I think the Fed needs to be very cautious about having Fed rate that potentially exceeds 6%. If you, like, if we see deflation, and I think we, 
I think we are seeing deflation, then you would add the deflation number to the, in quotes, risk free rate from the Fed. And at that size to exceed 6%, now you're starting to exceed the uh, long term return of the S&P 500 and it starts to become mm-hmm. questionable as to why, why not just put your money in, um, T-bills or a savings account, essentially, instead of in the S&P 500, if the S&P 500 is variable and the bank interest rate is not. This is, so basically, the Fed, Fed is at risk of crushing the value of all equities. This is <clears throat> quite a serious danger. Thanks, Elon. And just a follow-up, I don't want to steal thunder from March 1st down in Austin, but how close are we to that step change improvement in bomb cost where you could sell an EV for under twenty five or thirty thousand bucks and actually generate a profit. That that kind of real moving assembly line moment in manufacturing. Again, don't want to steal the thunder, but just if you wanted to wrap up with thoughts there, that'd be helpful. Oh, man, Thanks, yeah. I'd love to answer. I, if I were you, I'd probably asking the same question, but <laughs> we would be jumping the gun on future announcements. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone, for all your good questions, and we will see you again in three months' time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ready to build your wealth with penny stocks? Then get my new book, 10 Bagger Blueprint. It gives you a proven system for finding stocks which have potential to increase 10x and even 100x. It's the proven system that I've used over the last 25 years to help create over a trillion dollars in shareholder wealth by introducing investors just like you to countless stocks that have increased 10x, 20x, 70x, and even 100x. Get the book, 10 Bagger Blueprint. It's on Amazon. Only 15 bucks. It's going to change your life.